Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are, another episode, and uh, this episode is all about publishing. Ever thought of writing a book? Mm. Ever wondered how to do that? I've got somebody on the end of the phone, yeah, who I'm going to talk to, and it's Taryn. Taryn, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Enjoying the sunshine this morning. Good. Hey, well, is, it, is it really banging down over there? It is. It's all blue skies. It's beautiful. Because you're over in Lincolnshire, is that right? Yeah, and we actually bang smack in Lincoln itself. Oh, so no more. I bet it's beautiful with the old cathedral and lit up and everything, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, bless. Now, Taryn, give us a brief background, because, I mean, my, my, our listeners, they like to know um, a little bit about you. So, um, before we get there, let me just say, you did a TED Talk. I did, which yes. Was, oh, which was absolutely cracking. I was enthralled by it. And you know what? That story that you tell there leads nicely, nicely in for us. Um, and I think it just in, encapsulates everything that you're about, doesn't it, really? It does, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've been reading from a very, very small dot, um, published at the age of 13. Um, and it was something that I, writing was something I always wanted to do. And then life kind of gets in your way. Um, but then opportunities pop up and... Um, if you're clever enough to spot them, you, you take them, and that's exactly what I did. So uh, I'm very, very fortunate to do something that I, I love and, and keeps me getting up every morning enjoying it. Well, I mean, you say 13, published at 13. What was the first thing you ever got published? It was a short story. Um, my English teacher was a phenomenal man, and he introduced us to one of my favourite authors, which is Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and he read us um, a story and he asked us to write it from a different perspective, um, which I did. Um, and that was, the, that was the story that was published. So, yeah. Um, what was the story about? Oh, uh, it's Time Clock of the Heart. So the story is about an old man who is lying in bed dying. Um, and his carer, who he trusts, um, basically shines a light into his room every night. And the... Um, it's told from the perspective of the man who's doing it because he's he's overcome with greed and he wants the old boy to die quicker so he can get his hands on on his fortune. Um, so I wrote it from the perspective of the old man in in bed and and the thoughts that he had. Of, you know, was it um, something evil coming for him? Was it the the gate of of hell opening, or was it his his dear departed wife showing uh, a light for him to follow? Um, and that was how I wrote it, and, and no, then finding out that it was this man, um, how I exacted my revenge. How on earth do you come up with that? <laughs> 13 years old, you shouldn't be thinking about murder and slaughter and everything else. Why not? All, that, all those um, hormones raging, it's the perfect time to be thinking about that. <laughs> Let me exact it out on a young boy. Let me try this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go out with Taryn? No, 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 I'm all right. No, she's a bit of a doula, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Deary me. Where did you go to school then? Um, I went to school in um, a Midland town called Bedworth, or Bedworth, as it's known to everyone that lives there. So it's just outside of Coventry. Um, born in Coventry, raised in Bedworth. Because Coventry, I mean, is a very cultural place, isn't it? It is, yeah. How come you moved then? Um, my mum, bless her, decided that at the age of four, she remarried um, and bought holiday apartments in Skegness. Uh, and at the age of 16, I was transported from Coventry to Skegness and referringly, or lovingly referred to it as Scumness for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, exactly. I, loathed, I loathed and despised it. As you, I mean, you can imagine at 16, sort of going there when you don't know anybody and it's very hard to make friends at age because um, I hated the grammar school. Um, I remember an interview with the headmaster who um, looked like fish from Marillion. Um, <laughs> and I remember he, he, he was sat with his feet upon the desk. Um, and it's so Taryn, tell me why you want to come to our school. And I remember looking at him and going, I don't. <laughs> My mum was like oh, nudging me in the business. Don't say that. I don't want to be here. Um, so I, I joined. Uh, well, I got myself a YTS. So I'm giving my, my age away here dramatically, but yeah, <laughs> I got a YTS um, in Skegness Probation Office, um, 
which I mean I, I can tell you was not the place for a 16 year old um, and I did I went to college in Boston uh, well Louth and Boston um, got a BTEC national in business management and finance uh, and then went right I am done and um, I went to London for a while and I, I worked as a nanny in London and then I went back to Coventry um, where I kind of messed about but didn't just genuinely didn't know what I wanted to do um I eventually temped for six months which was the best thing actually it was 18 months of it temped for 18 months best thing I ever did figured out what I was good at what I wasn't good at what I liked what I didn't like um and more importantly how to behave in circumstances where you're new um you don't know anybody so it gave me the confidence to be able to walk into any company um, and and work basically, and it, it, it was the best grounding I, I could ever have for career moving forward. It really is. I mean, you know, um, I used to work in London as a technical manager many many moons ago for Alfred Marks, and um, you're right. I mean, just being out there. I mean, the, the days have changed. You know, when you can just move around freely and everything else. It seems. Yeah. Um, back in the eighties, I can remember that if you weren't on the move within 18 months, you were classed as an old fuddy-duddy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was so progressive then. You know, 18 months, move on, get the next one, get the next one. And each time, we were pushing our salaries up and up and up and up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, was a, it was a phenomenal time to, to do things. I mean, the, so one of the first jobs that I... Um, wangled my way into was working on a, a help desk for um, IT for computers. Now, I mean, those days, a computer took up a whole room. You yeah. Know? It, well, sorry, the server took up the whole room. You, you, uh, we had these huge, great computers on desk that, that were, were still massive things. Yeah. Um, and I, I know I spent most of my time going, have you switched it on? Has the cleaner unplugged it? You know, and those sort of questions. But I learned about computers, um, and I was only 19 um so really young to be going into it and what that did i mean that put me in such a brilliant position because i knew how they worked i knew how they ran um i started to to understand code um but at a time of when computers were viewed with suspicion i was sort of right there um yeah. and uh, the opportunities i had so i mean i <laughs> this will make you laugh i was a crane driver on the um <laughs> <laughs> on the island of grain docks um so it was the first that's down, that's down in Kent I've moved to I moved from um Coventry to Newbury in Berkshire which is where I learned about computers and then from there I moved down to Kent um so I, I, I got this job and they were the first fully computer operated docks in the country um and because I understood how computers worked they asked me to to go in so I would um, you know the big container ships we would unload those um, by computer of course if the computers went down which in those days they did we'd then have to be able to go up and um, actually drive the crane so um, I was a, a, a proper crane driver which was, was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Were you licensed? Um, I, I, do you know what I can't probably not I don't think they, they, they bothered it they were more concerned if I could actually do a computer um, that's the thing nowadays though, isn't it? If you look at today, you've got to have a piece of paper for absolutely. Oh, everything. I know. I know. I think the, the only piece of paper I had was one that, that got me through the door and said, she, this girl knows, knows computers. Um, I think the biggest qualification I needed there was to be able to put up with um, Docker language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that must have been a... There's not much you can call me that I haven't heard. Let's put it that way. I was just going to say, yeah, to take on that vocabulary. Yeah. And my thought, yeah. oh, oh, as a writer, I mean, it must have been tremendous. But do you know, it, I mean, everyone says to me, why don't you write your own story? Um, and there's two answers to that. One is that it's not ready. Um, I, I, we've, all, we've all got a book, you know, it's mine at the minute. I don't know which direction to go in. But, but, but and to be fair, I am so busy writing everybody else's. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, when, when I come to do it, I've got a wealth of characters that I, that I can pull out from. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, crane drivers are one of them. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, bless. Now that actually leads us, uh, leads us nicely into, um, like you said, you know, that everybody's got a book inside them. Do you believe that? I do, yeah. Um, so I got into publishing um, really, really obscurely. Um, I was, I, I'd recently been divorced and started my own company and I was writing web copy. Um, building websites, writing web copy and doing marketing. That was the direction I'd gone. Once I got bored with engineering and project management, I went into advertising and marketing. Um, and I was building somebody's website and they said to me, Taryn, you, you've written all our copy for, for the website and it's brilliant. Um, have you ever proofread a book? And I said, no, uh, not something I ever thought about. And they said, well, yeah, would you run an eye over this novel I've written? Um, and it was just like a light bulb going off. Um, and I worked yeah. with this author really, really closely, um, backwards and forwards. He was a brilliant writer, but he was quite a bit older. So his, um, I think he was reluctant to do sort of sex scenes and things. So he built, built up the, the drama of this, this couple getting together and, and how fraught it was, how they got together and how intense their, their love for each other was. And he built it up and built it up and then he was like, um, and then he blew out the candle and he kissed her. I was like, and? No. And, and what? You know. Um, so we sort of worked backwards. And I realised that that was the thing that I loved, was actually working with someone to get the book out of them. Um, and that's something I, I've done all the way through. I mean, sort of long story short, he then said, can you publish it? And I went, yeah, I can. Um, and I created the publishing company um, 10 years ago now um, and just did a few few books but then it sort of picked up and it picked up and I had a, a chat with somebody who's in the industry and they said to me Taryn um, one of the issues is uh, that you don't have a niche um, so when we look at FCM publishing nobody really knows what what it stands for and I thought yeah they're, they're right so last year um, I created a second publishing company, so I now have two. So FCM Publishing is all about non-fiction. It's all business books. So I work very closely with business owners to um, pull the, the, their business story out of them and also with self-help people, um, so counsellors, people that have gone through trauma, um, to draw that story out. But then I also created Kronos Publishing, which is all about life stories and novels. Um, so, so it's a very long-winded way of answering your question. Yes, there is a story in everybody. It's just them deciding which, which story they want to tell, how they want to tell it, and then getting them past the fear of thinking that they can't write. Let me ask you a question because I mean, like, <laughs> your your first, what was the name of the, the author, the first author that you published it? Um, it was. Um, oh my God, my brain's just gone completely. <laughs> Okay. It was Dominic yeah. Buffery, um, and it was a paranormal um, sort of good versus evil um, yeah. thriller. Because I mean, how did you, how did you get over the fact that you know it ended in a kiss? Did did you actually suggest the rewrite to put? The, I, re I rewrote it. Oh, you, oh, you did it. Yeah, I rewrote it and sent it back to him. And he, and he sort of spluttered like, oh, "Oh, I'm not sure," and then then he toned it down a little bit. And, <laughs> Um, and we compromised, but yeah, there were, it ended up with a, um, a love scene in it. So, less because it, sometimes it makes it, doesn't it? It does, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong; it was not um, graphic or, or anything like that. No, but, no. You know, you it, you kind of as a reader, you felt very let down. But um, well, that, just, to, just to end it on a kiss, that's like going on going on a date, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You're you know paying out all that money for the meal. For the pictures, for this and that, and the doorstep, and you get the kiss. It's like Steve, no. that's not the attitude. You don't take somebody out to dinner in order to get get laid. Now, come on. <laughs> oh dear, I tell you, the good old days. <laughs> uh, back in the seventies, that's how we would roll. You know. I know. I know. Oh dear, oh dear. Um, any any famous people that you've uh, you've actually published? Yeah. Um. So. I published, uh, this is a, it was a really cute story, so um, I, just about every author I've ever had come through the door has been word of mouth. 
um, which is brilliant. Yeah, I, I don't think there's, there's a better compliment than you can get than getting a, a referral. Um, but this Asian lady contacted me and she said, um, I, want to, I want to do a cookbook. And I said, well, I've never done a cookbook before, but we'll give it a shot. Um, but at the time I just had a major spinal surgery. So I was, I couldn't drive and I was kind of on the sofa with a big sort of neck collar on, hardly moving. She said, that's fine. I'll come to you. I'll make you lunch and we can have a chat. Okay, fair enough. Um, so on the day this, this, um, and, and she laughs because I, you know, I, she knows I described this way, this Asian Tasmanian devil burst into my lounge, um, cussing and stressing and um so I looked around and said oh yeah I've not met you before but I'm kind of sensing a bit of tension here what on earth's going on she said, I've just been to Waitrose and um I've got my spice boxes and they they they, they want to tell they want me to tell my USP is I don't know what a USP is oh, and I said right just stop and she looked at me and I don't, to this day I don't know why I said it but I looked her dead in the eye and I said Harveen don't worry about it within two years everybody will know your name you won't need a USP and she looked at me and she said how are we going to do that and I said the book um she went on to cook dinner and trash my kitchen and kick over a black coffee all over my cream carpet um oh, no. and it was, a, oh. it was an absolute nightmare and she still is but I love her to bits um and we created her book and what I said to her was you know as we were chatting through the recipe she would say to me so when I was doing this one, my mum would say this and my mum would tell me that or she'd slap my fingers with a wooden spoon. And it became really apparent very, very quickly that every single one of her recipes had a story behind it. And she, she cooked out of love. The, the yeah. recipes she chose were all from love. And I said to her, that's the difference in your cookbook. That's what we're going to do. So we will, for every recipe, there will be an anecdote that talks about why you've done it um, and what it means to you. Um, and on top of that, we'll have a full glossy image of either the finished dish or you making it. Because I don't know about you, Steve, but if you ever go through um, a recipe book and there's no picture and you've oh. never cooked it before, how the hell do you know what it's going to look yeah, exactly. like? Exactly. You, you need a visual, don't you? Yeah. So, so we put this book together and it's beautiful. And, and I, I mean, I still, I actually use it myself and I, I love it. It's so easy to use. Um, and Parveen is a total dynamo. So off she, she went and she, she got her book and she said, right, this is it. I'm going to use this. This is going to springboard me and blow me. She got herself an ITV TV show, um, Parveen's Indian Kitchen, which is actually, um, some of it is being re-shown on ITV on Saturday mornings with, um, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, James Martin. So um, okay. she, yeah, she's currently back on TV at the moment with that. So, so there's Parveen. And then she was doing a talk at the uh, East of England show. And Bob Champion, the jockey, uh, went up yeah. to her and said, I've seen you've got a book. What's your publisher like? And she said, Taryn's brilliant. I wouldn't be where I am without her. So he then rang me. Um, and, and we sat down and he said, would you help me retell my story? Um, for anybody that doesn't know who Bob is, he was a jump jockey, Grand National Jockey in uh, the 80s. Well, in, in, in the 70s, really. Um, he was at the top of his career. Um, in those days, jockeys were really kind of the footballers of today. You know, they, they were massive. Um, and he was diagnosed with testicular cancer in 1979 and given eight months to live. He had uh, grueling and extreme chemotherapy and the only thing that kept him going was the desire to win the Grand National on a particular horse. Um, and that was what kept him through the, through the chemo, which in those days was just brutal. Um, and having had four sessions of chemo, um, he went to the, the hospital and they said, no, there's still a shadow on your lung. You're going to have to have two more sessions of chemo, which meant he couldn't um, train for that year's national. And he was devastated. The next day he went to see old Aniti run um, and the horse went lame and they wanted to put him down. And he said that, that it was just like the, the whole rug was pulled out from underneath him. But he looked at the owners and he said, don't put him down. The two of us will come back together. Um, and oh. they did. And 11 months later, he won the Grand National on Old Aniti. He did. So, 
That so we, I mean, big, so big deal, wasn't it? It was huge. And I mean, so I mean, everybody kind of knows that story. And, and obviously, you got the film Champions, where John Hurt plays him. Yeah. Um, and his book was was originally done up to that point. Um, but what people didn't know was that after that, he went on to create his own um, cancer charity. And what happened was after he won the national, people sent him his win their winnings. Um, really? And yeah, he, he had thousands upon thousands of pounds, which obviously in those days was a lot of money. Um, and he said, you know, he didn't know what to do with it. So they created this, this charity and he created a, a, a much nicer waiting room for people um, in the hospital. And then he went on to um, create his own um, test center um, mm -hmm. and wow. research center. So over the years, over, over the last 40 years now, he has um, had, I think, over 15 million for male cancer research. His charity is the most successful small cancer charity in the UK. What's it called? It's called the Bob Champion Cancer Trust. Um, in 2000, through his research, well, not his research, but the, you know, his team's research, they eradicated death from testicular cancer. Wow. Which was obviously what he had. Um, and I said to him, Bob, why didn't you stop at that point? Because that was your aim, was to stop men yeah. dying from testicular cancer. And he I said, yeah, so nobody would have, have questioned you stopping at that point. And he said, why would I? Um, you know, he said, I feel guilty every single day that I wake up when so many people don't. Oh. Um, and they're now working to um, find cures or eradicate prostate cancer. So, um, so that that book was brilliant. I mean, it was so good to write with Bob. Um, I mean, he's such a character, and uh, but such a gentleman as well. I mean, there, there was so many stories about how um, he betrayed his, his wife and all kinds of things. So many lies told about him. And I said to him, Bob, you know, this is your chance to tell your story. This is your chance to get the truth out there. And he said, I don't um, air my dirty laundry in public. Um, those women are the mother of my children. Um, and people closest to me know the truth. And that's all that matters. Um, wow. Said, that's and profound. Said, and, I, and I said to him, I said, well, you know, that's, that's such a gentleman. And the way, the way I looked at it was, you know, there, there are three sides to every story. There's, there's your side, their side, and in his case, it was the press's side as well. Um, but he, no, he said, I, I don't want to, I don't want, um, I don't want to, to, to do that. So that was great. We, we launched it at the Grand National, um, which, I mean, as you can imagine, was a, a phenomenal thing to do, you know, had him there. and Clever bit of marketing. Good, so, it was a very good bit of marketing and a great day out too. So, yeah, um, I, so they're, they're probably the, the, the two most famous, but I've, you know, every author I work with is um, brilliant. And I, I am genuinely, genuinely very, very lucky with the people that I work with. That's good. You see that, again, see that this just nicely leads us into the next section. Go on. And that is, let's say I've got, a book inside me. Mm -hmm. Where do I start? Where does anybody start? Um, this is going to sound really, really pat, but basically, you just sit down and um, write. Um, I, I, funny enough, a small plug here. I actually put a blog out. There's a there's a blog on the website and also on LinkedIn as well that gives you the starting points to do it. And the things that I say is first off, sit down and think about um what the book's for so you know if it's if it's a business book is it um a door opener is it to springboard you um is it to get you um into places so for instance we published a book a few years ago for um, a guy who and he said you know there's, there's two companies i just can't get in front of once the book came out he did a handwritten note popped it inside the book um to the ceo of the company he got meetings with both of them and um, the, the book more than paid for itself in terms of the work that he generated out of it. So, so that was a, you know, his reason for doing it. It worked um, and it was, a, it was a brilliant deal for him. Um, I've got another author, Don Watson, who wrote the Rockstar Retirement Programme. Um, that's all about retiring 
almost now as opposed to waiting till you're 70 and you're too old to enjoy your life so it's about how can you live your life differently um and do things that will give you more value now as opposed to later um interesting his book um i mean he's, he was the first one i did as an audio book which was a brilliant thing to to, to see how that's put together my goodness as you, well you'll know awful lot of work involved in that right um so um but he um he said to me that since publishing his book his company has had over three hundred thousand pounds worth of additional business oh lovely yeah so yeah there was um so what's your reason that's the first thing so you know i work with business coaches it's a way to um help them get onto a platform of speaking if you can send a book off to an agent say this is what i'm about this is what i talk about it's a brilliant um platform builder um i've spoken to so a book i published this year surviving the war against yourself is a um a harrowing and i mean harrowing story of mental illness um Thomas and Amber are married. Tom suffers from various mental illnesses, including PTSD and psychosis. And their story is written from two sides. So Tom will talk about what it's like actually living with that um, and what was going on in his mind at the time, how he felt. And Amber talks about it from her perspective of being his wife and his carer. Yeah. Um, and the problems that she's found, um, particularly within the sort of privacy and people not talking to her and, and um not including her in her, his treatment um, and there's a point in that book where they both talk about um him take, trying to take his own life and how he, he describes putting the noose around his neck and pulling it tight and she describes finding him on the floor the being having cracked in the, the garage oh. um it's not an easy read but their reason for doing it was to to shine a light one on the fact that the you know anybody can have a mental illness um, right. and you know what it's like to go through but also for, for carers so because they're often their voice isn't heard so they, they literally just wanted to share their, their stories so that people felt that they, you know they weren't on their own mm. so there are a lot of reasons for writing a book you just got to decide what it is if it's a novel it's probably because the characters inside your head are waking you up at three o'clock in the morning going let me out right um, and when they a do that people, that happens to a lot of people though doesn't it it does yeah um i i to be fair when i when i've been working with people it's happened to me as well um because you, you sort of take that on so if if you've got a voice in your head that is screaming and wants to be heard then they, they won't let go until they are and you'll wake up with plot twists you'll wake up with um ideas and the best thing you can do is have a notebook by the side of your bed and write them down right um, so, so that's that's my first tip: is decide why you're writing it um, and what it's going to be used for. Give it a working title because you, you'll know this yourself. Um, that if you put a name on something, if you create a project and you give it a name, it becomes more real, mm. um, and then you're more inclined to actually go ahead and do something with it. That's like a good uh, a good piece of advice. That, that like you say, it's real. Then, then it. Like, it is. Yeah. To it, right? Okay. Where am I going to start? I, I've had authors that have actually, um, before they've even write, written it, have created a mock up book cover, and put that as almost like a screensaver, so that every time they put the computer on, they can see the book and well, they've kind of visualised having done it. So if you're, you know, if you're if you're a person that, that works well with, with uh, vision boards or visualisation in any way, that's a really good tip. Um, second tip is then to um, visualize your author, uh, sorry, your reader. So, what does your perfect reader look like? Um, what sort of books are they reading? Why are they reading your book? What are they going to take from it? Um, and then it's a case of creating a really, really simple skeleton. So, um, decide what the book's about and what tone of voice it's going to have. And then just write yourself maybe 10 chapters to begin with, what's in each chapter and bullet points, the things you want to put in each chapter. And what that does, that kind of keeps you on track. Um, and then my final tip is start with the easy one. So um, right. you know, if, it's, you know, if it's a business book um, and you're writing about your biggest success or something like that, and you find that easy, write that one first. Don't, don't set yourself the difficult one to, because you'll just never do it. Right, right. Um, so you know write the thing that's easiest 
and then just keep going. Um, don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about format. Don't worry about you know any of that. Just write it because there are people out there like me and, and the team that I work with that have all the skills to make it read right, um, to sort out your grammar. You know, I, I get people saying to me, "I can't write. Um, I'm dyslexic." Well, you know what? Um, so was Agatha Christie. So was a few other people. Um, didn't stop them. Wow. So that is what, not a reason to write. Right, but what would you do in that case? Let's say they are dyslexic, yeah, <coughs> and it's yeah. all over the place. Have you ever had any uh, audible, uh, you know, recordings and everything else, you, you, and you take it from there? When I when I'm ghostwriting, that's what I do. I so I will um, I will do what you're pretty much doing here, and I will sit and record conversations and type those up. Um, I get sent. Um, books from people that are dyslexic and we, we literally just go through it and rewrite it um, obviously I mean, there, there's a cost implication to that because it you know we've got to pay some editors and everything else to do it but um, we, we can still do it. it just because you know your your words are the, the way everybody else reads it doesn't yeah. mean that we, we can't fix it of course we can't it's not a problem the, the one thing I always say is there are people out there that can amend your words, <clears throat> sorry, so that um, your sentence makes sense. But what we can't do is write what's in your head if you haven't got it out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I mean, it, it's interesting you say that because there are people that are probably frustrated and just thinking, oh, I don't know. Oh, they, they write it all down, they get it down, they read it and they go, oh my God, that's rubbish. Oh, let me discard it. When actually what you're saying is, no, don't do that. Just get it all down on paper. And do you know what? There, there are people out there that can make head or tail. Make, make total sense of it. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and I say that you, you can record it. Um, the, there are um, the software that transcribes it for you. There are people out there that will transcribe it. Um, that, that there is not being able to write, not being grammatically correct is not a reason to not tell your story. Wow. See, I always thought there was. I thought, yeah. I thought that was a, you know, that was a sticking point. No, absolutely not. Mm, myth gone. Bang. Out the <laughs> Move on. Yeah. Get the next one in, lady. Yeah, the, 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 the one that um, you do need to be aware of is the fact that you're sticking your head above the parapet. And as, as you know, Steve, the minute you do that, some bugger's going to want to shoot you in the head. <laughs> um, so, you know, there, you, yeah. you've got to be prepared. For that. And it's one of the things that I said to, to Tom and Amber when they did theirs, you know, one of the things in the book was that they both suffered from bullying um, and they'd had trolls and things. Um, and I said, you know, when this book comes out, are you ready for that? Because some people are very, very cruel um, yeah. and unnecessarily so, but they're out there. As long as you're prepared for that, um, as, as long as you're, you know, you're ready for people to discount what you say or be negative about it, then you're fine. But going into it, not think, thinking that people won't, then that might hit you a little bit harder. Yeah, I think the thing for me is, like you say, I mean, any form of media, you know, like you say, stick your head above that parapet, they're going to slay you. There's always someone out there that thinks they're better than you or has got a better story or who do you think you are? You know what I mean? It's one of them, isn't it? My answer to that is, well, where's your book? Yeah, there it is. Bang. You see what I mean about you? I mean, people look at you and think, what a nice lady. No! I see the opposite there. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? You, you want to you want to slag somebody off for telling their story. Well, then once you've written yours and published it, and we can all see how much better yours is, then you've got you've got a platform to speak from. But when you haven't, shut up. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Yeah. So okay, so now what I've gone and done is I've gone and written this this thing. Yeah. yeah. What's my next step? What would I need to do? The two the two things you can do. One is find an agent. Um, and what an agent will do is they will pitch your book to suitable publishers. Um, and a lot of, certainly the, you know, the, the, the big four, um, Harper Collins, Penguin, Hache, yeah, th those guys, they're not going to take a book from the man off the street. They will only go through agents that they know and trust. And as you can imagine, you know, they're, they're getting thousands and thousands of submissions every year. Right. Um, so you can, you can send your book to an agent. They will take a percentage of any deal that you get um, if your book is picked up by a publisher. So there's that you can do. 
you can um, send a submission to independent publishers like myself um, and you know if it's um, something that we if it's a genre that we work with then we will review it um, and give you an answer either way um, or you can self-publish and you know there, there are lots of ways that you can do that Amazon have made it very very easy to do um, it's a little bit of a bugbear for me um, because there, there's a lot of absolute dross being published yeah. because people have made it so easy um, and what that does that kind of reflects on the smaller independents like myself when it comes to bookshops because right. you know they're, they're kind of a bit wary I'm, I'm very very lucky now that I've established a relationship um, with distributors and with the, the bookstores themselves so that when I put something forward it, it's taken seriously but it's, it's taken a lot of graft to do that um, what I will say is if you do self-publish, the chances of a bookshop actually taking it are very, very slim. Um, simply because there is no um, reliability that you've done all the things that a publisher will do, which is proofread it, format it, make sure it reads right, make sure it's got a right, professional yeah. cover, all of those things, you know. Um, it, and it's really important to do that. It's, it, it reflects on you, but so, so that... There you answers. You you know you can pitch it to an agent, you can pitch it to a publisher, or you can publish it yourself. That's what well, even in that format, that that garbled format, you just hand that over. Or are we talking? You know, we'd need to get help first in order to put it into a format that's readable and, and uh, accepted. If you, if you are pitching it to an agent to go to one of the big boys, then I would say send it off to an editor first and right. get it professionally proofread and it, it it pays anyway i mean you're going to have to have any book professionally proofread and edited if you want it to be taken seriously by a publisher what type of costs are we talking um come on steve I, that that kind of question is always um depends on the size of the book depends on the yeah. word count depends on how badly it's written how much work it needs doing yeah. um some um proofreaders work per word some will work per um page count so it all depends really on, on how much it is and, and how much your editor is and again with everything you pay for what you get so when I, I got a book sent to me recently for publishing that had been professionally ghost written um and i read it and i went back and i said i'm really really sorry um but i can't publish it um, and oh, wow. the reason being is that it reads like um, My First Day at the Beach by Bob's aged eight. Today I did this, I went here and I did that and it was nice. Um, oh my goodness me. You know, it, it was, there, there was no personality in it, there was no character to it. Um, and what we've then had to do is go back and, and completely rewrite it, which, you know, is, is a massive sort of, cost implication and time implication um, so do do shop around with the people you get and make sure that you get referrals make sure that you you know it's, it's as with anything you know you yeah, yeah. wouldn't go to the first mechanic that you find so do find someone that's going to work with you and understands and be able to say to them this is what I want my book to sound like yeah um, there's nothing worse than getting a, a, a book a, another story I got uh, an author who I know really well to me he's a business person that i know really, really well and i'm sure he won't mind me saying that so when he sent me his, his manuscript i was really excited because i know how funny he is and i know how talented he is um and i got it and i went back to him and i said who the hell's written this and he said why well, it's rubbish but i didn't actually use the word rubbish i used something else but um and uh, i said it doesn't sound like you that there's no sense of your personality in this whatsoever. It could be any generic um, person. So he went back and, and rewrote it, and the, the second manuscript he said well, was brilliant, absolutely perfect. You could hear his voice all the way through. It's strange, really though, isn't it? I mean, you, you mentioned personality and character within words, and it's like some people will be thinking, well, how do you convey that? Everybody has... Um, something that they say all the time. So, when, so for instance, when we did Bob's book, um, 
Bob used uh, several phrases. And when, you, when you're working with somebody really closely and you are interviewing them, those phrases come out. So you make sure that those phrases are peppered throughout the book. Um, for, so people reading it will go, oh yeah, that's definitely. There was a couple of sentences I, I wrote and Bob said, Tara, I don't even know what that word means. So I asked her and he wouldn't use it. Um, so, you know, it's about being absolutely true to how you sound. Um, and, you know, particularly within, it, within a business book, if I've, or um, a self-help book, if I've seen you on stage and I've heard you speak, mm. and then I pick up your book and it sounds nothing like you, right. then I'm, I'm being robbed. I, I want to, to hear you say the things that, that I know you, that you would say. It's interesting you say that. I'm, I'm reading a book. I'm just um, embarking on a documentary uh, of a fellow that I've met. His name is David Tyerman. Now, David left the UK um, back in the early 80s and went off to America to make his fortunes uh, with just a suitcase. Mm -hmm. He built a business within five years, became a multi-multi-millionaire, he was dealing with the likes of Ralph Lauren, um, who was it, Gap, um, Macy, you name it, all the big brands, yeah? Yeah. Um, and then he lost it all. I think it was back in, yeah, it was in the early 90s because they had the, uh, the big crash, yeah? <laughs> but the point is, when I read his book, you're right, I hear him. And it's really weird because, I mean, I've... Um, the documentary is really about his life, you know, his story, because that, that, that's what I love to do. I, I, I love people's stories. And they, they, again, like you say, there is one in, in all of us. But mm -hmm. this guy is exceptional in as much that he is now a brand guru. And he's taken all that, that experience from life and three ups and downs, but has come back even stronger. And this book... It's just like you're saying, it's little phrases. Yeah. You know, um, th there was one where he's going, now listen to me, darling. You know, you really need to take this on. And you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, and he's lovely. You know, him and his, um, his partner. Now his partner's uh, another exceptional um, fella. Um, it, they're in fashion. Mm -hmm. You meet the pair of them and you're like, oh my God, let me, re let me read the book. Yeah. You know, let, let me see the uh, see the documentary on this guy. I mean, it, it's it's amazing. So if you if you read that and there was nothing in that book that you could associate with the person you'd met, you'd be really really disappointed. Yeah, and he he actually he talks about being true to yourself as well. Yeah, it is. And yeah, I mean, the word authentic is banded around left, right, and centre. But in this case, it's true. You, you've got you know, if you've got a northern accent. Then write with a northern accent. Right. If you, you if you swear, then swear. Um, you know, the, the, there's there's no rule that says you you can't um, swear in, in a book just because it's it's a business book. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes that, that sort of shock. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting it, it. It's a it's a docker read. Um, right. Yeah. But, you know, it's, <laughs> sometimes it it kind of shocks you as much to go. Oh, okay. But but if you know that that's how that person would say it, yeah, then that's fine. It's the same with humour. You know, a lot of business people think their book has to be really straight down the line and very serious. God, does it really? Are you going to read that? Yeah. No, you're not. You're going to get two pages and go, "Well, this is boring." Yeah, put it down. Um, it's interesting that you say that because I mean, I've just embarked on. Um, I've just had to create uh, a training program for a company dealing with. Uh, uh, what is it? Well, abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, of all levels. Um, and it's how people would do um, one to ones. Yeah. Yeah. But over a telephone or a, a computer. And how they call it disinhibition, how mm -hmm. they just let themselves loose. You know, it, go, it gets out there and, the, and their mouth runs away with them and the consequences that has and everything else. So this company needed a training program. We, we came up, we delivered it. 34 people went on it and it was like mm, where do we go from here the point i'm making there is i had to be a little bit careful with the language yeah 
you know, um, the way it was coming across because it was aimed at, well, the, the target market were, were um, people to do the training. They yeah. were going to be like the advisors. So you couldn't actually get real. But, but what, you know, I was going through some of the slides and I wanted to say particular phrases and it was like, it's not going to be acceptable. But I think you're right. I mean, it's even with the, with the training, you know, it's like get your own personality in there and project that. Yeah, it's, um, it's about knowing your audience. Yeah. So if you think your audience will take that, and, uh, you know, I mean, the, back in the 40s, swearing, you know, was, was really, really frowned about. In the 80s, it wasn't used. But today, um, you know, I mean, I, I've got two boys that are 22 and 20, um, mm. and the, the language, whilst they're very respectful of me, when they're speaking to each other, that there is no um, filter. You know, it, it's it's so they say what they, they say what they think, yeah, yeah. but it's not used. You know, it, if I swear at you, it's because I because I mean it. Yeah. Um, whereas they they almost use it as punctuation. Um, and so I think you know you you've got to know who your audience is. Um, yeah. If you, if your book is a real top level um, professional industry book, then maybe you wouldn't be you yeah. know dropping the f bomb in there. Um, yeah, sure. but, but you know what? If in if in a board meeting you turn around and go, you bunch, you're all a bunch of effing idiots, and that's what you would say. Why wouldn't you put that in? Yeah. Well, I've noticed. I don't know whether you've noticed this. You see, more and more films now are using the c word. Yeah. That, that, that's, a, that's possibly one word that I am really reluctant to put in a book. I've got to be honest. Right. Um, I. I I have if it's if it's done in the right way. I mean, yeah. I've got um, a rom com and he uses it, and I, and I, I kind of was like, oh, can I? Um, I don't, I don't like it. Yeah. That's my own personal view. But if it if it works in the context, then it works. That's you see that that's the key there, isn't it? The context. You see, yeah. I'm from down south, and I I grew up with the c word, but it had so many different um, meanings. You know what I mean? You, you, you'd say it within a greeting. You'd have yeah. a go at someone. You'd, um, within jokes, oh, and it was, it was just one of those words. And the same with the F word. Yeah, my other half seen, my other half seen Leeds. Um, and he worked at a radio station. Um, and um, they used it all the time. All the time. Um, and, you know, he, he will use it. And I'll say to him, oh, yeah, yeah just... I'm, I'm, I, to me, it's, it's a word to, to be used in extreme circumstances when the, the, there isn't any. And I, I mean, I remember one of the things that um, I don't have very many me memories of my own dad, but um, one of the things he, he, my mum said he always said was um, swearing is a form of a limited vocabulary. Um, and you only use that word when you can't think of anything better to say. Right. Um, and now, you know, in his generation, that's true. However, for me, the C word is probably one that, that I would use when, when I'm so angry that I can't think of anything better. <laughs> oh, dear. She uses it, people. <laughs> there yeah. are only a couple of people I would ever use it for. Yeah, I think the thing is, I mean, is, you don't be hypocritical, you know, at the end of the day, isn't it? You know, if you're going to use it, you're going to use it. I mean, it's like with the film scripts and everything that we write, um, Scott and I, Sometimes those characters, because they are they are bawdy, that is that's the turf they come from. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and like you say, it, it just it's conveying the right context or putting it in the right context. It is, and, and also I think different accents lead to it, lead into it better. Yeah, your yeah. accent works really well with it. Um, it makes it your your accent will make it sort of more friendly, whereas mine makes it um, more brutal. It's I think funny a, a northern that. swearing is, is, is definitely more powerful than a southern one. Right, it's funny you say that, because when I, uh, I used to meet uh, another mate of mine, uh, an actor, and uh, I, <laughs> I would be with him five minutes, and all of a sudden, he would get onto the Cockney link, and then he'd start using the profanities and everything else, and his wife would turn up. And she, uh, she would say to him, uh, uh, in one particular scenario, was it? Yeah, go and get me a drink, and he just went fuck off, get it yourself. In that, in that, you know what I mean. I can get away with that because yeah. of how I deliver it. 
He just didn't have the delivery, but he used it. Well, I'll tell you what, she slaughtered him in public. Yeah, yeah. I imagine so, yeah. Oh. I mean, it's, it's quite good. If I, if I, um, I shall, I shall swear on him, but if, if I said to you, you're a total bastard, I've, I've got that kind of harshness as well. You'd be like, um, go on, you say it. Well, bastard, you yeah, bastard, you, yeah. Yeah, it's not the same. You've not got the same vehemence that I've got. No, it. but then again, what you've got to remember is I actually talk proper. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Go on. Bastard. You, you How do you get to faster? And that, it's, it's, not, it's an R. Oh. It's, a, it's, a, it's a harder A, isn't it? Oh, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. yeah. And you're right, it, it actually conveys something or, yeah, a bit different for me. Mm. You know, when you when you start getting into it, it's great, isn't it, phonetics? <laughs> and we've gone off on a completely different tangent. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, let's bring it back. Um, okay. okay, yeah, so, I mean, we've now got something and we've, um, we're, we're trying to get out there. But you mentioned, mm. you know, uh, the independence. I'm more interested in the independence. Okay. Um, and the only reason being is, is like you say, they are a, a smaller organisation, it seems. Yeah. Um, in my mind they they would probably take very good care of you than be lost within a huge organization yeah i, I mean i obviously i don't want to to be, be caught saying anything um against my no 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 not at all dad, but and that's, that's yeah, they are. i mean well so what i've had i've had a couple of authors come to me who have been published by the big boys and they've said that that um they felt like they were part of a convey belt so you know they were there. Yeah, well, that's, that's oh the yeah, we love the book. It's great. It's great. It's great. And then you pass on to somebody else. And then you pass on to somebody else. And then, right. only, um, and then what happens is that they take control. Yeah. So, so one particular author said to me, when it came to doing his second book, they wanted to dictate when it was released, uh, what the title was. Um, they wanted a lot more control over it, um, and he felt he didn't want that. So you know, if you if you work with me, then. Um, First and foremost, the copyright is yours. Now, a lot of the big boys um, will want to take the copyright for themselves. So, so one of the things I always say is that you you fully own the copyright. I own the book, so um, you know if, if I've published the book, you can't then take that and give it to somebody else to publish. But the content of it is yours, so you could take that content and have somebody else publish it if you then. Um, ended your contract with me so that's so there's a difference um your royalty that you'll get from the sale of the book you will always get a higher royalty rate with an independent than you will with the big boys you're unlikely to get a um advance payment because we, we, we don't have the budget for that and that's you know, a lot of, a lot of, yeah i mean a lot of the big yeah. publishing houses don't know unless you you know you're you're huge that then they're, they're not offering it anymore but right. certainly as little guys we, we don't have that um, the, the, the one thing I will say, Steve, and, and this is something that um, I'm really, always really, really keen to, to point out, is if you think you're going to be the next J.K. Rowling um, or the next, you know, um, Tim Robbins or whatever, yeah. then you're in it for the wrong reason. Um, you will not make money out of your book unless you sell an awful lot um and the, the way that you make the most money is selling it yourself either at the back of the room or at events um because by the time the um bookstore has taken their percentage you know, waterstones want a 55 percent discount on wow really yeah so you know you, you're selling the book for 10 pound waterstones will give you four pound 50 for it then you've got to take out your print costs yeah uh, which is anything between one pound seventy five and three quid depending on, on you know how big it is how many pictures it's got in it what you know how you yeah. have it printed um so you know you, you're lucky to make two pound fifty on a book Goodness it for ten pound so so it's one of the things that you know i always say to people you know why are you doing it? If, if you want it to make you rich then think again and i'm always really straight up and honest with people about that because I, I would never steer anybody wrong. So working with an independent, you know, you, you get that kind of flat out advice from us. Um, you know, we will work with you yeah. to get the right book. I mean, uh, you know, I, 
I've got authors that, that I work with all the time. Um, and I want, when I put a book out there, it's got my name on it as well as it's got their name on it. Right. So I need to make sure that when it's on a shelf in Waterstones, that people are going to pick that up and go, yeah, that's actually a really good read. Whereas I think sometimes with the um, bigger boys, it's all about how much they can sell. And, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is a brilliant example of that. Um, they had a market for women that were looking for something a little bit raw more raunchy than Mills and Boone, and they published a load of Tosh. And ah. That, that, right, is right, my, right. that is my well, personal opinion. You know, there are people out there who've loved it, but to me, it's it's poorly written. Um, did, did you did you read it? I couldn't read it. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I put it down after. Um, I don't think you've I've managed to get through a chapter, I don't think. Was it bad um, memories or what? No, it was just so poorly written. Get <laughs> <laughs> um, off, she never did that. Yeah, that's yeah, impossible. That's that too, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I'm probably going to get letters now. But probably going to get, oh, oh. Um, no, it's... But, yeah, they, they got away with that because yeah, yeah. It, they had the, the money behind it to hype it um, and um, off it went. Whereas, you know, if you work with somebody like myself, we'll make sure... Yeah, don't get me wrong, every single book goes out with an error in it. Um, and that's down to the fact that you can read and read and read and read and you will yeah. go word blind after a while. Um, yeah. And there's always going to be one error. And, and that's not just an independence. The, the very first Harry Potter books um, are selling for thousands and thousands of pounds now because the, there's errors in them. Um, you know, the, the Stephen King, um, his, I think it was It, recently when the, when the movie came out, that was printed with pages all back to for, front, you know, 400 oh, really? before 200, yeah. Wow. So, so it happens, you know. Yeah. It, it happens with every single book that's out there. Um, you know, I mean, as you can imagine, I read a lot. Um, I am now at the point where I can't read some of my favourite authors that I used to read because my um, editing head kicks in, uh, particularly when it's been written in America and not been um, transcribed for the UK market. So it still has all the American English as opposed to the UK. Um, and I find that really hard, you know, for instance, yeah. they lighted the candles is the one that will make me hurl a book across the room because um, <laughs> they lit them. So it, it's little things like that. Um, yeah, yeah you, you're going to get it. So working with an indie, you'll get a closer relationship. You'll have more freedom for the book to be how you want it to be. Um, yeah. And you, yeah, you, you'll have that hand holding. Cool. Now, let me, let me ask you this then. So, you, you touched on something there, you know, you, you, um, they own the, the copyright of the content, you own the book, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Let's say a book has been written yeah. um, and as somebody like myself gets hold of it, yeah, as a filmmaker and goes, oh, do you know what, I like, I like the look of this. I want to make it as a short film. Mm -hmm. What would I need to do? So it all depends what the contract has been signed. So my contracts say um, I that we will uh, negotiate a deal with screenwriters yeah. um, so, and then the publishers will have a percentage of it and then the author has a percentage of any deal that we make with the screenwriter. If it's been self-published, then it just goes speaking to the author and, and saying, we want to make a movie, and they go, yay! Um, but yeah, you would have to speak to a publisher first before you can um, take the contract. What about if you did a, a complete rewrite to do a screenplay? Um, if it's based on the same story, you would still need to speak to the publisher. Right, okay. Beware, people, all right? There's no <laughs> way around this. Beware. Yes, um, and we get very, very cross. Yeah, I wouldn't want to cross you. <laughs> no. I mean, to be fair, you know, if it's, if it's a smaller publisher, um, the, the chances are, okay, yeah, let's do it, because... Anything you put out there is going to help us sell books. Right. So, so we're, you know, we're pretty reasonable folk. We're not going to go, yeah, yeah you can have it, but it's going to cost you 50 grand. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, we are sensible, well, I like to say we're, we're sensible people. Um, and that, that's, again, that's the thing working with, a, with an indie is that we've always got the authors back. You know, we want to make sure that um, they, they get what, what 
what's good for them when we get the book out there. So yeah, yeah. yeah we, we wouldn't kind of go, no, absolutely not. All we'll, we'll pay us a shed ton of money. Yeah, no. Unless you've got a shed ton of money and then absolutely I'm all of it. So what would you say to somebody? Yeah, what advice would you give to them right now? Yeah? Yeah. Would you say to them, come on, get up off your ass, get put pen to paper, let's do it, let's do it together. What what would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um that yeah, I hate the expression there's never been a better time, but there's never been a better time to write your book. You can't go anywhere, you can't do anything. So all of you business owners that I have ever met that have said to me, I'd love to write a book, I just don't have time. The universe has listened. You now have time. Um, so that's one excuse gone. The I can't write a book, there's another excuse gone. Um, the only thing that is stopping you writing right now is you. So do it. Um, get in front of your computer. Don't worry about how it reads. Just get it out there and give it a shot. You never know. It could be something that changes your business right now. What about minimum, uh, minimum page count? What should we be looking at? There isn't. Um, there is a... Um, obviously you, you can either have um, a small ebook, you could have a novella, you could have a pocketbook, um, or you can have a, a full on big um, self help guide. There, there, was a, there was a bit of a phase for smaller reads, um, so bite sized things, for, particularly for business owners who are lazy or who just don't have time to, to read huge, great swathes of content. Um, so giving them an easier read tends to. to you know, make them want it more. So yeah, yeah. There, there was a whole phase of sort of twenty thousand words, forty thousand. Um, you know, I would I would suggest a, a novel is going to have lots more than that, and also biography yeah. is going to be no less than sixty thousand, more likely a hundred. Um, but don't don't let that bog you down. Really, don't you know? Don't be thinking, yeah. oh, crikey, I've got to write a hundred thousand words. That's that's a huge mammoth task. I can't do it. It's like somebody putting, you know, a all you can eat buffet in front of you and saying, right, off you go. You, <laughs> it it kind of outfaces you, and you're like, I, I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Just just sit down and write a chapter. See how it goes. Is there a market for short stories? Yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly on um, sort of the sort of kindle reads and things like that um again you know people have uh, suffer with a little bit with attention shortage so if you, little short stories are great and it's a good way of getting started as well because you can then always put them together in, in a book full of short stories that's where i was leading with that one the only reason why i say that is because i know a couple of people have written some fantastic little short stories and it was almost like mm, do you know what let's bring them together yeah, well, you know, let's collate yeah. them and put them put them in, and then uh, maybe put it out as a um, uh, a filming opportunity. Well, there's that. I mean, there's a lot of sort of famous authors, um, Jim Butcher. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the ones I've seen. That what they'll do is that they'll they'll create a book on a theme, um, and then you get the authors come together and they each stick a short story in. Um, to yeah, yeah. way to all different authors together um, and it's a way of introducing people to you as a writer oh, you know what that's an excellent book. idea isn't it yeah 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 I like it well do you know what believe it or not we've done uh, we've done over an hour wow that's cool yeah. I know I, I knew that you could talk because you're a woman um, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, what I'm going to do is, uh, firstly, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed for taking this time. My pleasure. Uh, talk to us about the publishing side of things and everything else. Now, secondly, I'm going to say to you, do not go off the line. All right? Okay. I'm going to do my wrap-up now to my, uh, my little audience that uh, want to know what's going on next and uh, just to say my thank yous. So bear with me. I'm going to finish. You're going to hang on to the line. All right? It will go pause for about three seconds and then we're in. Okay. So, here we go. Taryn, thank you very much, you know, for today. Um, it's given us a bit of an insight into the publishing side. I'm, I'm, I would love to, no, I'm going to start to write. I've got a few ideas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in touch with you and I'm going to put it out there. Guys, if you're out there and you've liked this, Taryn now is going to give us all her information before we do the close. Yeah. Uh, in fact, do that now, Taryn. How can people get hold of you? As okay. if you want them to. 
<laughs> yep, yeah, so um, there's two websites you can have a look at. There is um, FCM Publishing, which is Foxtrot Charlie Mike Publishing.co.uk and Kronos Publishing. Um, both of those are out there. All of our contact details are on there. So if you're interested, have a look and see what we've done. Fantastic. Tarry, once again, thank you very much. Guys, thank you for listening, and we will see you again another day.